I want to welcome everybody here. Thank you for taking the time to sit through the class, for showing the interest in the class. Um, for those of you who do not know, my name is Jim Bollinger. I have a channel, Do Right Fabrication. I have a shop at the house at home on my farm. I'm a full-time firefighter paramedic for the City of Orlando Fire Department. My shop at home, I do a little bit of machining, a little bit of welding, actually a lot of welding. I teach for Lincoln. I started doing that many, many years ago. Uh, this is the class I teach a couple times a year. Uh, we usually will teach about 1,500 students the same class. Let's talk about torches. Torches have to be cooled, okay? We gotta cool them because we've got an arc that's around 10,000 degrees at the center of the arc. We've gotta get the heat away from the arc. We primarily have two types of torches. We have what we call air-cooled torches or water-cooled torches. Air-cooled torches are not cooled by air. However, they are cooled by um, argon. The argon comes through the hose, swirls through a series of tubes in the head. This comes out and, and um, cools all the copper components in the head. Liquid-cooled torches have two water lines. Water goes through there, circulates through the torch itself, goes back to a radiator in your cooler, and that radiator takes the heat off the, the coolant. These are two torches here. These are both air-cooled torches. They look similar, but they're, you notice this one's bigger. This is 17 torch. Once you get into TIG welding, it'll be a common term. I'm, give me a 17 or give me a nine. This is a nine torch. The only difference is the size. Smaller, smaller components, smaller, tighter areas. Bigger makes means it can handle more heat. Yes, sir. Water -cooled he asked, is water-cooled torches, does the coolant have to be isolated to, to the ground? You use what's called a low or no conductivity coolant so the coolant doesn't uh, conduct electricity. Has anybody seen like an exhaust collector on a hot rod before and ever wonder how they weld up inside there? As a kid, I was like, I don't know how they get in there to weld that. Let me show you something. See this TIG torch right here? Look at this, this is pretty trick. This is what's called a flex head torch. My point here is they make many different kinds of torches. This torch, they also make in what's called a straight torch. It's a straight shank torch. So all of this screws onto the end. You can go straight down inside the pipe extend the tungsten out a little bit and you can weld that way. And that's how they do a lot of that kind of stuff. I will tell you that this is the only torch I ever use. I rarely even use my 17, unless I'm using a lot of high current welding, a lot of heat. Don't get freaked out, you gotta go buy a bunch of torches because really a nine or a 17 will get done just about everything you need to do. It's one of the most frustrating things is having a torch that's jacked up, you can't figure out how to put it back together. We'll start with the 17. These have been well loved. Notice I have an emphasis on the word loved. When you TIG weld, remember we talked about MIG and stick, the electrode gets consumed in the weld process, right? In, in TIG, there's a tungsten that hangs out. That's hanging out too far. I've, I've hung it out far so that you guys can actually see it sticking out. Normally, I'd probably have it somewhere about like that, but I realize y'all in the back can't see that very well. It's about a quarter inch right now, but you can change your stick out of your torch to what you're welding. If you're welding a fillet, you need more stick out to get into a fillet. A fillet's a 90 degree weld. You need to get down in there in the root of the weld so you're gonna stick out farther than if you're doing a flat weld. The back cap on this torch unscrews off the back. You see that? It's a hollow. If you have problems and you can't figure out why you keep getting black in your weld or why your weld keeps not looking correct, one thing to suspect is this little O-ring. You see how that O-ring just rolled up like that? It happens all the time. That little O-ring comes off. You'll, it'll roll off when you take it out and you lose this O-ring. Then you get a Venturi effect, you start sucking atmosphere into your, with your welding gas. That O-ring is necessary. This is called the collet. I'm with a bunch of machinists today, so everybody knows what a collet is. It's the exact same thing, it's made out of copper. The collet is sized to the size of the tungsten. This is a 332 tungsten, this is a 332 collet. They, they, we'll go over tungsten size here in a little bit. This is the front of the torch. This is a ceramic cup. This is called your cup. There's all different sizes. They have a number designation. This one is a seven. That is in sixteenths of an inch. So a number seven, the opening is a seven sixteenths. I'm only telling you that so that you sound educated when you go to order one, because you're just gonna go, I need one about that big. That's what most people do. There are times when you weld a WPS, a weld procedure sheet, it will tell you the exact size you need, but for most of us welding at home and in our shops, we don't need to know that. Just know that that opening gets smaller and bigger, because if you need to get it into a little tight area, a big giant cup won't get you down in there. It stops you from getting in there. This is a collet body, just like a collet closer. This is a collet body. This is a collet. The collet goes in the back of the collet body when you tighten the back cap down, just like any other collet. It shoves the nose of it in here and tightens down and holds your tungsten. 
One thing I want to point out to you on the collet body, there's a bunch of holes in here. See those holes? That's where the argon gas flows out. It swirls around inside this cup, comes out the hole, keeps your tungsten and your well protected from the atmosphere. Now remember, there's always a, a, a bigger, better way, right? This torch is, works exactly the same way, but it's equipped with something different and I want to show that to you. See that torch right there? See how it looks big and fat on the end compared to that? Let's think at home about our kitchen sink. You know that screen on the bottom? You take that screen off and turn the spigot on, water goes everywhere, right? Sprays all in the kitchen sink. But if you put that screen back in there, that diffuser makes a laminar, nice laminar flow of water. We got that nice column. This is called a gas lens. This gives us a nice laminar flow of argon gas. See what it looks like? You guys see the screen in the end? It's basically just a diffuser, yes. It's called a gas lens. Does the exact same thing as the collet body, but costs more money. I'm gonna head that question off. They're like, well, why do you even make collet bodies? When students learn, they wreck things. So you teach them on a, on a collet body. Once you get good and you don't wreck it anymore, you don't burn things up, you move to the gas lens. Now, there is a a great advantage to the gas lens. Remember we were talking about welding in tight areas. How do you do that? Normally we're gonna weld like this gentleman said about a quarter of an inch to stick out, maybe three eighths. Stick out, sticking out of the, here. Can everybody see that? It can stick out as long as, as far as it needs to, provided we keep it covered with the argon gas. None of the atmosphere can touch it because it's gonna be literally at molten temperature. Just below its melting temperature is what the tungsten's gonna be. As soon as the oxygen hits it, you get all kinds of oxides formed and the thing goes away. When we put that gas lens on there, we could probably go out about like that far. Because of that nice laminar flow of gas coming out over our weld, we're trying to get into a tight area. Okay, so what is that, inch and a quarter? Remember we talked about a little while ago, we were um, talking about MIG and TIG and stick, and when we're welding, whatever we set the machine to is what we get while we're welding. In TIG, that's what we said that's not the case. We can adjust that control. The way we typically adjust that control is with a foot pedal. We call that an amp troll. That foot pedal is called an amp troll. There are hand controls, there are button controls, there are a lot of different ways to do it. There's nothing wrong with them. They take a lot more skill. And as a beginner, the last thing you wanna do is get frustrated because you're melting stuff all up and you can't make your welds look like you want. Everybody, with the exception of very few, feels very comfortable driving a car, golf cart, that kind of thing. So it's an automatic, I wanna go faster, you automatically feel like you can push down on that pedal and it comes much easier to you, especially in the beginning. Uh, my tungstens that I handed out, did they make it back around yet? All right, remember, did you guys all get a chance to see the two color bands on the back of these? One's gray and one's purple. Uh, this one right here, I don't know, you guys can probably see the red. See the red, red on the back? Okay, tungstens are classified by their alloy. If you've been welding for a while, you know you most likely used a red or a green. Red is a 2% thoriated, green is a pure. The green you use for AC, the red you use for DC. Go home, if you got green tungstens, open your, open your drawer, take the green tungstens and find the closest garbage can and throw them away. That's my personal opinion. It does not reflect the opinions of Lincoln Electric. Guys, we got better ways to do things now. The tungsten's gonna carry all the heat. There's a lot of different alloys out there. We went through a stage where we used red for everything almost, uh, mainly because the lanthanated, ceriated, circinated, all those other colors you see on there, they were a lot more expensive and they work better, but not that much better. There is a classification that you notice down at the very bottom, it says gray, it's called rare earths. American Welding Society, they're the ones that call this out. When you get a weld procedure sheet, like in an aerospace lab, everything has to be exact. The exact size collet, the exact size tungsten, the exact amp range, the color of the tungsten, the degree that the has to be ground to a point, all of it is exact. There is no error. As a welder, your only job is to make the good weld. You don't have to guess. We all of us in our shops at home, we have to kind of figure it out. If you have a 2% thoriated tungsten and you buy it from one company to the other, the composition should be exactly the same. That way, AWS can say, you use the 2%, there's no variation. It was welded correctly. But a lot of companies came out and they said, hey, we got specific whiz-bang things that we want to put in 
are our tungsten alloys. They allowed a color classification for it, gray. So if you bought a gray tungsten from company A and a gray tungsten from company B, they may not be the same. The trouble with that is there was a gray that came out that everyone was like, wow, this thing rocks. That's this gray. We call it a tritone. The trouble is that you could not use it in any well procedure sheets. Nobody will ever write it in because nobody can guarantee that the gray you use from company A is the same as gray he uses from company B. So AWS came out with another, another one that's purple. That is the old tritung. They call it E3 now. Let me make it simple for you. If it's got purple on the back, keep it in your drawer. All the others, well, when they're all used up, don't buy any more. That's my personal opinion, okay? The purple works really well for about everything. The red 2% thoriated works well too. You cannot sell these in this state. In the state of California, these are known to co cause cancer in laboratory rats. Thorium is radioactive. If you have a luminescent watch dial, it has thorium in it. But it's thorium oxide, it's not pure thorium. So yes, it is mildly radioactive. Yes, in the California, you can no longer sell these. So the purples have replaced the reds. Tungstens have all different sizes. You can go from big to skinny to really, really skinny. From about 20 thousandths all the way up to like a quarter inch. There's all different sizes in between. Let me simplify this for you. Buy a 1 16th and a 332 and you can almost weld just about anything in your shop unless you're welding very, very thin, very thin stuff. Don't worry about all the other stuff and they're gonna throw charts at you and get this amp range and that ramp range and all this. Here's why all those charts were created. Tungsten has this property that at a certain temperature it likes to emit electrons. If you've ever started your arc in your TIG welder and you ever had the arc, arc kind of wander or go off to the side, all of a sudden you came onto the, I got some head nods out here. You come on the pedal and all of a sudden it, the arc comes on and goes good. The reason that it does that is the tungsten came up to the temperature where it became a really good emitter of electrons. So if you take a really big fat tungsten like a 332, that's this big one here, and you try to weld with like say 20 amps, you may not be able to get enough heat to make your arc real stable. But for the most part in your shop, 116, 332, done. Plus, keep it really, really sharp. When we sharpen the point, think of it like a reverse lightning rod. We want to focus that heat exactly in the spot. We create a very fine point on the end. Obviously, the cross section of that is very small. So we create, take a big tungsten, we made a small tungsten out of it. But at the same time, we we're able to focus our heat and put our heat exactly where we want it. If it gets all split out, it kind of looks like split out, like you stuck a firecracker in the end of a stick and it blows out the end of it, you may need to go to a bigger size tungsten or bring your heat down or just grind your tungsten more frequently. Guess which, which end you're not supposed to grind on a tungsten? Both ends are identical. One just has the color band. Don't grind the color band off. If you do, you better hope your wife has that color fingernail polish inside the house to recolor it. There's a couple of, couple of rules for grinding tungsten. One is that you do it in a well-ventilated area. Don't do it in a closet. It's a heavy metal, you're gonna grind it. I don't need to you know, draw you a picture there. Whatever grinding wheel you use to grind your tungsten is your tungsten grinding wheel. You don't use it for anything else. Reason being, like if you grind aluminum on an iron oxide bench grinder, that iron, a wheel gets loaded up. When you grind that tungsten, you're gonna do it in a specific way. You put those molecules in there, they transfer across the arc, and they become uh, discontinuities in your weld. You can do it on a belt sander, you can do it on a uh, grinding wheel. They make, now, they make a Dremel tool looking thing. We get to use those, those things are awesome. They use a diamond wheel. It looks like a little Dremel tool when it's got a hole, you just stick the tungsten in and twist it, done. When you grind a tungsten, if you think of a bench grinder, the wheel goes around like this, right? Round and around. You're gonna take that tungsten, you're gonna grind it in this direction. You are not gonna to go to the side of the grinding wheel and grind it like my dad would do it. Because I've seen my dad make a point on rod forever and he puts it on the side of the grinding wheel and just turns it. Here's why. When you make those circumferential scratches around that tungsten, the electrons are gonna go down, they're gonna hit the first scratch and they're gonna make this wide umbrella and they're gonna jump out the sides. We wanted a point on it, right? So all the electrons came off the point. Well, that sharp edge we make with those circumferential scratches, you can't control your heat cone. So by doing it with the grinding wheel going this direction over and over and over like that, what we wind up doing is putting scratches linearly 
okay? So the electrons flow all the way to the tip and then come off. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed what you saw here today. Be sure to subscribe to my channel and like us on Facebook, please. Somewhere down below here is a link. See you soon.